Mr. Simon Finch, one of our first and most illustrious members. Allow me to welcome you to your parole hearing. Let's get this one over quick. Northwest Quadrant. I don't believe 187. it. Northwest Quadrant. 187. What's a 187? Identify code 187. MDK. Murder, death, kill. <laughs> We're police officers. We're not trained to handle this kind of violence. How was the fiendish Simon Phoenix apprehended back in the 20th? In the end, it took just one man. One cop. John Spartan. John Spartan? That's right. They called him the Demolition Man. This man comes from a dissimilar method of law enforcement. I'm not sure he's any different than Simon Phoenix himself. How long have I been under? 36 years. The conditions of your parole are full reinstatement into the SAPD and immediate assignment to the apprehension of Simon Phoenix. What is John Spartan doing here? Your family's dead, your past is dead. Enjoy your moment of prehistoric bravado, because after you leave here, it will be over. Demolition Man was released in October of 1993. Produced on an estimated budget of $57 million, it recouped nearly $160 million worldwide. The film wasn't shown to critics at the time, so I think some members of the public were unsure if it was going to be any good. Generally when a studio decides not to let the press see it before the public it often means the movie stinks, but that wasn't the case and many loved it and many critics gave it a good write up on its general release. That year Last Action Hero came out as well. It cost the same amount as Demolition Man to produce and made roughly the same amount of money domestically, but many deemed it a failure and Demolition Man a success. Demolition Man had been one of producer Joel Silver's pet projects since 1989, based on an idea by Peter Lenkoff and Daniel Waters. The script itself had many rewrites over time and had a number of uncredited contributors, such as director Fred Decker, who apparently said the movie should start in 1996 and then cut to the future just to show Spartan and Phoenix in their own time. This was the first feature film Marco Brambilla directed. He was well known for producing commercials and to this day has only directed a handful of films but has concentrated on the art world producing video style installations. On set he would do a lot of retakes, up to 50 if he wasn't entirely happy with the shots but apparently more recently Marco had said he didn't achieve his full vision on the movie. I'm not entirely sure what he feels is missing but as with all first time directors they are going to have some restrictions with creative control. For the majority of the scenes set in the future they would shoot on business complexes shot around Los Angeles in California to give the future a more bland and sterile look and they achieve that really well. The location I love the most is the exterior of the police department, the Baxter Pharmaceutical Building. Joel Silver got GM Motors to loan $69 million worth of concept cars to the production, 18 in total. One was a replica of GM's ultralight concept car. GM had only one of the ultralight cars, so Warner Brothers hired a crew to build 11 fiberglass replicas. The production designer on the film was David L. Snyder, who had recently worked on Super Mario Bros. the movie, and was the art director on Brainstorm and Blade Runner. So David is no stranger to designing future tech. There are a number of things you will notice that appear to be similar to technology today. You've got the iPad and Skype, conference calling, a sort of chat roulette, mini disc and the cars have auto drive. This technology is currently being tested at the moment. One of the movie's great jokes is that Taco Bell has become the dominant franchise in the future and all the restaurants are all very upmarket and food is served with champagne and the food like most expensive restaurants is served in tiny portions. They did produce adverts a time with the movie where if you buy a combo meal you get a free poster. In the UK we don't have Taco Bell so to avoid confusion they changed it to Pizza Hut and redubbed some of the lines of dialogue and digitally replaced the Taco Bell logos. 
Stallone having a career boost after the huge success of Cliffhanger, continues on his box office high with Demolition Man, playing John Spartan. Stallone actually said in an interview with Starlog magazine, he plays himself throughout the film and doesn't really put on a character. You do get that impression with Sly. He does seem very natural and down to earth in his performance, and surprisingly he is very good with the humorous moments. His comedy timing is spot on. So let me get this right. Spacely Sprockets here, who's now the man in charge, the mayor of Gov, who wants to take me to dinner at Taco Bell. Lord knows I wouldn't mind a burrito. Wesley Snipes is easily the highlight of the film for many. He provides some of the best laughs, and the way he reacts to the changes in society are some of the best moments in the movie. Come on, Hal. Where the goddamn guns? You are fined one credit for a violation of the verbal morality standard. Fuck, Fuck you! Being an expert martial artist, he had to slow down his technique on camera because shooting at 24 frames per second, it's hard to capture it on film. Like many proper martial artists, they have to slow things down a little to make it register on film. This was Sandra Bullock's first big budget feature film and definitely her most successful at the time. This was the first movie I saw her in and like Snipes, she is one of the movie's selling points. Her personality and charm really sell you on her performance. She obviously impressed many because she skyrocketed to stardom and went on to star in Speed and The Net. Dennis Leary plays Edgar Friendly, the leader of the Underground Dwellers. As a stand-up comedian, I think he ad-libbed a lot of his dialogue, especially the scenes where he rants about the people above. That's Leary's selling point, having him lose his temper. I've never been a big fan of Dennis Leary once he stole some jokes from the legendary Bill Hicks. I lost total respect for him. The late Nigel Hawthorne plays Dr. Cop 2. For UK viewers, he was well known for his role in the BBC TV series, Yes Prime Minister. He apparently didn't get on well with Stallone and Snipes, probably down to their different acting backgrounds and personalities. In the not too distant future of 1996, Hollywood is starting to look a bit like Blade Runner. LAPD Sergeant John Spartan leads an unauthorised mission to rescue hostages, taken by the psychopathic criminal Simon Phoenix. After a thermal scan reveals no sign of the hostages, Spartan enters Phoenix's lair to confront him. John thinks he is bluffing when Phoenix claims the hostages are dead. Before he is arrested, Phoenix detonates several barrels of C4, destroying the building. Spartan escapes with Phoenix in time, but the fire brigade locate loads of dead bodies. Spartan realises he was set up by Phoenix and is charged with the hostages' deaths. Both men are sentenced to a cryo prison, where they are cryogenically frozen to serve out their sentence. In 2032, Phoenix escapes the prison during his parole hearing, easily killing the warden, armed guards and several peace officers. He steals a car and heads towards the city centre, now San Angeles, the merged utopian state of Los Angeles, San Diego and Santa Barbara, presided over by Dr. Raymond Cock II. Phoenix demonstrates superior speed, strength, agility and martial arts, and it appears he's being rehabilitated with new skills. He is also multilingual and proficient with future technology, managing to hack an information booth. Bad habits and activities are prohibited and sex and having children have been regulated. The San Angeles police are incapable of dealing with criminals such as Phoenix and there hasn't been a murder for 22 years. Veteran officer Zach Lamb suggests that Spartan be revived and reinstated to the force to help them capture Phoenix as he was the only man to bring Phoenix to justice. Lieutenant Lenina Huxley is assigned to assist Spartan in his transition. The revived Spartan has trouble adapting to life in the future, as most of Huxley's fellow officers find him thuggish and uncivilized. But Huxley takes a shine to him due to her love of 90s culture. Spartan guesses Phoenix will try to acquire a gun, which the head of police informs him only exists at the museum as weapons have been outlawed. John Spartan surprises Phoenix, breaking into the museum's weapon exhibition, and takes him on with a shotgun. But after a quick battle, John realises Phoenix's strength, and lacks the firepower to take him down. Phoenix quickly evades Spartan before running into Cock 2, and tries shooting him, but he is unable to. Cock 2 reminds him of why he was revived, to kill Edgar Friendly, the leader of the Scraps, with distant fighters living in the sewers beneath San Angeles. After witnessing their exchange on security cameras, Spartan and Huxley determine that Cock 2 programmed Phoenix to make him more physically capable and therefore dangerous, using him to eliminate Friendly. The cop duo with their young officer Alfredo Garcia enter the underground city to warn Friendly of his imminent assassination, whilst Phoenix confronts Cock 2 and demands that he release a list of other prisoners to assist him in carrying out his mission. 
The film has a mix of CG, matte paintings and in-camera special effects. The explosion at the beginning is very impressive. It's one of the largest explosions I've seen on film. Seeing it in proper widescreen definitely shows off its fantastic scale. For the scenes showing the cryogenic freezing of the prisoners and the defeat of Snipes is your typical early 90s computer generated effects. The effects team didn't abuse the visual effect and don't push it too much, making it look fake. It does its job well. The stuff I love most is the matte paintings that expand the new San Angeles. Some are a mix of miniatures and live action footage combined with mats. It's like what OCP wanted Delta City to look like in the future if this was the world of Robocop. The worst effect is unfortunately the final visual effects shot, when the laboratory is destroyed causing an explosion of the outer wall. We have this really flat optical flame that is very weak and looks like something from a computer game. This is a shame because everything else in the movie still holds up. The director had the most difficulty with the car chase scene because you have more restrictions and less control of the backgrounds, because not everything is going to look futuristic on location, so you have to storyboard the scenes and choose his setups very carefully. After Elliot Goldenthal's amazing score to Alien 3, he became a popular choice in Hollywood and his next project was Demolition Man. It's a very dark, brooding score, especially at the beginning and the confrontation between Snipes and Stallone at the end. Listening to it by itself, it sometimes seems tonally different to the film. Elliot throws in more contemporary beats and unconventional techniques for Snipes' attack on the police and when Stallone enters the museum. There are many cues in this film he transferred over to Batman Forever. If you go back and watch the film again, you'll notice this very clearly. It's not blatant copy and pasting, but I think Batman Forever sounds a little too familiar to this. At the time it was released on CD but only contained roughly 30 minutes of music. There appears to be no bootleg available of the full score, but hopefully in future one of the many record labels will release an official complete soundtrack. The end titles featured the song Demolition Man performed by Sting. It was originally written for Grace Jones who performed it in 1981, but the police did their own version as well that year for their album Ghost in the Machine. For the film Sting himself, we worked it as part of his own solo career. There was also a music video to tie in with the movie. For the Super Nintendo, Mega Drive and Mega CD, Acclaim produced and published the Demolition Man video game. The game didn't arrive till late 1995, a good two years after the movie's release. It was just your traditional standard platform game that had you playing a Spartan running around gunning down the enemy and chasing after Simon Phoenix. Over a number of the levels it would change its style to an isometric playing field, which mixed up the gameplay a bit. The Mega CD version had cut scenes from the film and the FMV sequences aren't too bad in quality in comparison to the Terminator Mega CD version. The graphics are detailed and animated well for all the console versions. I found the game to be a lot of fun so definitely worth trying out, but beware. Proper copies go for a lot on eBay. In 1993 saw the release of the new 32-bit console, the 3DO. It was the next generation gaming machine. Virgin Interactive developed an exclusive version for the system that had material shot specifically for the game, such as new cutscenes and intros for the player to experience throughout the game. It arrived late December of 94. I had a 3DO at one point, picking it up when the console was on its last legs. I had the Gold Star model. I only saw the game once on sale, but it cost a bit too much at the time, so I never got a chance to play it. Checking via emulation, I'm glad I didn't waste my money. You can see what they are trying to do with the game, featuring different styles of gameplay all into one game. You have a light gun level, a one on one fighting match, driving section and a first person shooter. It looks very good and it did receive positive reviews at the time, but I think people were just impressed with the visuals and didn't pay much attention to the clunky gameplay and lousy controls. It's definitely a product of its time and you should only seek it out if you're a hardcore fan of the film. It's not awful, but play it with low expectations. Good, but... I would say it's horrible yet terrible, ugly yet disgusting. You suck. And Demolition Man is a highly enjoyable action film with a great sense of humour that is played out well with its use of satire. It's not as smart as say Robocop, but when it does use it well, it's absolutely hilarious. I love the idea that in the future everyone listens to radio jingles instead of actual proper music. The cast is really what works well in this movie. Despite Stallone putting in a great performance, he is outdone by Snipes and Bollock. Sandra definitely draws you into the movie with her charming personality and her enthusiasm for the past. Living in a future where they have sacrificed many things to keep society safe, you can tell she finds it all very frustrating. Her attempts to fit in with Spartan and her reaction to being propositioned with real sex are just priceless. 
all the actors play it so straight with all the silly dialogue and scenarios they are put in, it makes the comedy aspect so successful. It's these moments that make the movie stand out, not the action. Just before the film came out, they had announced that Stallone would be playing Judge Dredd, and Rob Schneider would be starring in it as well. But me being stupid was confused when I saw this film. I thought, where is Judge Dredd, which was supposed to be coming out? When you're a kid, and if you didn't read film magazines, you'll get your movie news from the odd video games magazine. Movie related shows in the UK, we had a show called Movies, Games and Videos, or word of mouth. So you were a bit limited on information. Oh by the way, did anyone else feel the ending to Dread was a bit like Demolition Man? I swear these movies are too similar. One thing people were always confused by was the three seashells gag. Instead of toilet paper, they used three seashells in the future to clean their bums. But the joke is that it's never explained and left many wondering how to use them. Even the actors were quizzed on it and Stallone's answer was very humorous. His idea was you grip the turd with the two seashells and the remaining shell you use to scoop up the rest. But I foresee a major design flaw here. What if you ate too much Taco Bell? I've always wondered what is beyond San Angeles. Are other parts of the USA or even the world similar in their attempts to keep society constrained? Also, I've always wanted to see more of the world outside. You see the landscape in matte paintings or outside a window. It's a shame they didn't expand upon it more or even consider revisiting it for a sequel. Demolition Man is pure 90s with its design and ideas of the future. It's certainly more successful than others with its predictions of future tech. Many flicks from the 90s that dealt with technology generally revolved around the idea of virtual reality, which became so popular at the time and the prospects of what it could do but its popularity waned very quickly. Looking back at films now, like Lawnmower Man, the ideas of VR seem quite laughable, but Demolition Man did something different and expanded more on the ideas of society and how people appear to have changed for the better, whilst in fact became more close-minded and restricted in expressing themselves than ever before. I think the movie does drag a little bit when Stallone goes underground and meets Edgar Friendly and has a shootout with Phoenix. That's not to say it's boring, but because of the visual design is not that interesting, it's the kind of stuff we've seen before, and everyone seems to have pinched their outfits from Mad Max. I think the first three quarters of the movie is where it shines, and the ending is your standard action affair. It's not forgettable, but it's not that special either. I love the movie's photography, handled by my favourite DP Alex Thompson, and the staging and editing of the action is done extremely well, thanks to the talents of editor Stuart Baird. The production is full of talented technicians and artists, and it shows. Being Marco Brambilla's first movie, I'm really impressed. He has a strong technical mind and exhibits a lot of talent. It's a shame he didn't do more science fiction films. The movie has aged really well. The story and dialogue is snappy and thoroughly interesting and all the performances are top notch. It's hard to fault this movie aside from the average ending, but it still remains one of Stallone's better films. If you've never seen it before, don't just brush it off as a generic 90s action flick. It's a movie I always return to. It provides a fresh social commentary whilst handing you plenty of laughs. Shit! Don't worry, I'll get you with the next shot. I don't think so. <laughs> no kiss kiss, no bang bang. And you were doing so well. Now, don't you have a job to do? Huh? Isn't there a thought repeating in that barbaric brain of yours? The name Friendly, Mr. Edgar Friendly. Don't you have someone to kill? I guess you weren't part of the cocktail plan. Greed, deception, abuse of power, that's no plan. You live up top, you live cocktail's way. What he wants, when he wants, how he wants. Your other choice? Come down here, maybe starve to death. All right, then why don't you take charge and lead these people out of here? I'm no leader. I do what I have to do. Sometimes people come with me. All I want to do is bury Cocteau up to his neck and shit and let him think happy, happy thoughts forever. And I got bad news. I think he wants to kill you. I hadn't counted on this, but I must say you worked out beautifully. People are terrified of you. What's new? People have always been terrified. Yes, but this time they're really intimidated. Now, I'll have carte blanche to create the perfect society. My society. 
Officer, return this man to cryostasis immediately. Be well. Be fucked. I'll see you in hell, Max! <laughs> 